Good evening, everyone. My name is David Van Zant, and I'm the president here at the New School, and it's my great honor uh, to welcome all, all of you to this celebration of the 80th anniversary of the periodical social research. Uh, we're especially pleased to have with us tonight our ambassador from Germany, Peter Wittig, uh, Professor Michael Ignatiev from Harvard, and Fritz Stern from Columbia. And I very much look forward to their remarks. But let me just say a, a couple words first about uh, the, um, the Journal of Social Research. It has been the flagship um, journal of the New School for Social Research since 1934, when it was founded by the members of our university in exile, uh, with the support of my predecessor, Alvin Johnson, the director of the New School for many, many, for many, many years. The social, the social research journal is something very special. I myself remember as a young graduate student in, in sociology picking up the journal of social research. It was very different than sort of the standard fare, uh, the standard fare out there in the academic world of, of sociology at least. And I always looked at it because it always had very innovative ideas. Uh, and also though, it was always tied to what was happening in the world. It was socially engaged politically engaged, uh, and it was, it was something that, that was different and I thought very, uh, and I thought very important. So um, I think it's a, this is a great event. We can celebrate that journal. And now I want to ask Arian Mack, um, who is our Alfred and Monette Morrow Professor of Psychology at New School for Social Research, to come out and say a few words. Uh, I should point out that Arian, of course, is the architect behind this event and pulling it all together as she does so, with so many things here around the new school. Uh, we're very proud of her, and I must say we're very lucky to have her as well. So, Arian, please. Thank you, David, and thank you all for being here on this, I think, remarkable anniversary. Remarkable because a journal started by the German exiled professors in 1934 is, I think, still alive and well today. And remarkable, and this is a private remarkable, that I've had the privilege of editing this journal since 1970. By now, the journal is just simply part of my DNA. Thank you, thank you. I can do, do, do no better on this occasion than to quote from Alvin Johnson's introduction to the first issue of the journal, in which he foresees the journal as representing a new kind of thinking, where continental thought patterns confront the issues of the world. And now I'm quoting. The methods employed are obviously continental, the material is of the world at large. The subject matter will be drawn from interests that transcend the boundaries of a single country. It will include theory, political, social, and economic problems of social and political organization that are worldwide in their general character, though national in specific characteristics. In great measure, I think this description continues to capture the essence of social research. On another occasion, Alvin Johnson also spoke of social research as the public voice of our institution. And I think to some extent it has also continued to be that. And that we have tried to make that voice louder and more far reaching through a public conference series which we began in 1988. Excuse me, 88. And on April 30th of this year, we will host our 33rd conference on sanctions and divestment, economic weapons for political and social change. We will welcome you all there as well. As Alvin Johnson made clear at the outset, the mission of the journal has been to foster discussions of matters of serious public concern, exploring them in terms of their immediate import and whenever possible within their historical and cultural contexts. The importance of this undertaking is, I believe, as urgent today as it was in 1934. The pursuit of scholarly knowledge and ideas is again under threat, but not now from a totalitarian political regime actively censoring inquiry and speech, but from the changing ideological architecture of universities. 
we are faced again with the challenge of fostering a tradition of free inquiry in an academic world that increasingly is judged less by the quality of its ideas and the cultivation of critical thought than by quantifiable outcomes. We are more and more judged and constrained by that is those who spend endless resources on quantifying and measuring what is in principle, I think, unmeasurable and unquantifiable. And here I am merely echoing the words, words of many others, and in particular of Marina Warner, who wrote a brilliant article about the, uh, what's going on in the, the UK higher education system. While the New School for Social Research and Social Research, the journal, has deep ties to Europe, had deep, deep ties to Europe, they remain strong and our ties to Germany, which were foundational, continue to be extremely important to us today and it is why we are so blessed to have the German ambassador to the United States speaking on this occasion. But before I turn the mic over to our celebrated speakers, I'd like to say some public and heartfelt thank yous. First, to all the many authors who have written for the journal over the years. It is their journal, as well as ours. Thank you, too, to all those who have spoken at our conferences and to the many foundations that have provided us with the support we needed in order to uh, hold them. Thank you, of course, to our editorial board who have made the editing of the journal far more interesting than I can say and often fun. A major thank you to Ira Katz Nelson, who edited and introduced our 80th anniversary issue. An especially heartfelt thanks to Kara Schlesinger, the remarkably able managing editor of the journal who has worked with me since 1997 and for whom the journal is also part of her definition. And now I'm gonna uh, introduce to you our first speaker, uh, Professor Fritz Stern. Fritz Stern, besides having been an old, old friend, is the university, more importantly, the university professor emeritus at, and former provost of Columbia, with, his, with which he has been associated since the uh, 1940s. He is, for us, has, uh, important in many ways, but particularly because he was the member, a member of our board of governors uh, at the New School for Social Research. Most importantly of all, he is a renowned historian of German history. His work focuses on the complex relations between Germans, G the Germans and the Jews in the 19th and 20th century and on the rise of national socialism. His many books include The Politics of Cultural Despair, that's an early book, Gold and Iron, Bismarck, Bleichwörter, and the Building of the German Empire, Einstein's German World, and most recently, I think most recently, Five Germanies I Have Known. He, Fritz is going to speak first, and then he will be followed by the ambassador, and then by Michael Ignatieff. I'm going to in, uh, introduce both the ambassador and the uh, and Michael now, so I don't have to come back up here. Uh, okay, so just bear with me. This is a great pleasure for me. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Peter Wittig, who is in, uh, our ambassador from Germany to the United States. He has most recently served as permanent representative of Germany to the United Nations. Ambassador Wittig joined the German Foreign Service in 1962. In 2006, he was appointed Director General for the United Nations and Global Issues at the Foreign Office in Berlin. He has written many articles on the history of ideas and on foreign policy. It, it is really a great pleasure. We feel, I really feel lucky that he said yes when we wrote and asked him to come. And then uh, let me introduce somebody I have known a very long time, have not seen in a very long time, and feel very honored that he also said yes, and that's Michael Ignatieff, who is Edward R. Murrow Professor of Practice at Harvard Kennedy School. He's a Canadian writer, teacher, and former politician. He holds a doctorate in history from Harvard and has held academic posts at King's College, Cambridge, the University of Toronto, and the University of British Columbia. 
He served in the Parliament of Canada and was leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. His books include The Needs of Strangers, which somehow when I read, I remember really changing my life when I read that book. Uh, uh, Scar Tissue, Blood and Belonging, uh, a, a wonderful biography called Isaiah Berlin, about Isaiah Berlin, The Politics, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Rights Revolution, Human Rights as Politics and Ideology, and most recently, Fire and Ashes, Success and Failure in Politics. I, we really are delighted to have all three of these people up here and speaking to us, and I want to thank them all. Good evening. Thank you, Arian, uh, and ladies and gentlemen. We are here to celebrate the 80th anniversary of social research. It began as a German emigre effort made possible by American hospitality and generosity. The journal and its editors opened minds in America, not closed them, opened them, and both were parts in what has been called a great intellectual migration. Some of the original editors came to hold important posts in the American government and in American universities. The journal has continued as an American venture with the tinge of European philosophical and self-critical flavor. Some of the original editors helped to build what they had dreamt of before exile, the founding of, the liberal, of a liberal German democracy, which this time succeeded and constitutes in part, perhaps, the greatest success of American foreign policy. The New School was born in opposition to American uniformity. In fact, it was born of domestic dissidents, academics who resented the prescribed anti-communism of the 1919 variety, communism then thought of as a vague malignant disease related to Marxism. The New School founder, Alvin Johnson, was a fierce liberal disgusted by the political simplicities and name-calling of the time, which he remembered as, quote, through the war and post-war periods, the educated mind had been subjected to torrents of emotion-bearing catch catchwords, pro-German, pacifist, sentimentalist, socialist, red, pink, fellow traveler. These torrents had eroded the minds of the educated as violent summer storms erode the fields, carrying away the fertile topsoil, gashing teep gullies, leaving the field incapable of growing anything but witchcraft and bull nettles. Only a Nebraskan farmer could have put it that way. <laughs> Two eminent Columbia historians, Charles Beard and Harvey Ro Robinson, shared his disgust and became centrally involved in Johnson's dream of a new educational institution. Thus was born the graduate faculty, which lived off dissidents in the United States and finally in the world at large. By 1933, the once so esteemed German universities had been purged, but survived were fanatic party members, silent mediocrities, and diehard specialists. Almost all of them servile traitors of the spirit. It was not as if just Jews had been purged, and so-called Aryans as well, such as Paul Tillich. By the mid-1930s, there were only two good German universities left. The university in Istanbul was one, a product of Kemal Ataturk's enforced westernization and modernity, who had attracted German emigres also. Classes in Istanbul began in November 1933, his authoritarian style continued. His secular aim is now being abused and abandoned. The graduate faculty in New York was the other German university. It was to grapple with the social and political problems in a philosophical, self-critical fashion. Old age has its occasional advantages, very occasional. I, know, I knew quite a few of the members of the graduate faculty, and later of the French counterpart in New York, the École Libre. What splendid people. I'm thinking, for example, of Hans Neusser and Max Wertheimer. 
Social research, as has been said, was the public face of the graduate faculty, international and unselfconsciously interdisciplinary, and not at the expense of any discipline. The graduate faculty was distinguished by its weekly seminar, where colleagues discussed their work in progress, economists, I hasten to add, not Freddy von Hayek, psychologists like Max Wertheimer, philosophers and generalists, and a woman, the former Friede Wunderlich, the former member of the German Democratic uh, Party, and a specialist on labor affairs. What other institution at that time had such a unified and diverse existence? Social research has continued to flourish. Let me cite but one example which has meant a great deal to me. In 1997, it devoted an issue to decent society, based on Avishai Margalit's book by that name. Philosophical and pragmatic re re reflections discuss the decent society, which by definition does not humiliate. Allow me in conclusion two personal remarks. Social research flourished for the last 45 years under one editor, Arian Mack, who clearly started her career as an exceptional teenager with a sense of quiet authority. <laughs> and let me mention the editor of the current issue of social research, Ira Katznelson, whose life and work, the two and best cases being inseparable, embody the virtues of the old graduate faculty to which he adds the best of American learning and energy. Thank you. David uh, Van Zandt, Arian Mech, uh, my dear friend, he's just leaving, uh, Fritz Stern, uh, Michael Inegtiev, and ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm so delighted to be here with you tonight. Um, it is a great honor for me to speak at a place that means so much uh, for Germany and, and the German-American relations. And let me, at the outside, congratulate with very warmly, uh, the new school and for 80 years of uh, publication of this uh, magnificent, magnificent uh, journal, Social Research, under the outstanding editorship of uh, Ariel Mack, 45 years, what a tradition and, and what, what an achievement. Let me start uh, with a personal note. I was a young student when I first heard about the uh, new school. It was through my professor for political theory at the time back in uh, the University of Freiburg in the south of Germany. His name was Wilhelm Hennis, uh, who would later become the academic advisor of my doctoral thesis. And Wilhelm Hennis, who unfortunately passed away three years ago, had just completed his year as a Theodor Heuss visiting professor at the New School. And he told us, uh, the students, uh, about his fabulous time he had here and the great encounters uh, he had here. Professor Hennes arrived at the New School, of course, in an era where scholars were free in their decision uh, where and how to conduct their research, which, as we all know, was not always a given in the course of history. In fact, the first bridges between Germany and the New School were built when many scholars were anything but free. The architect of these bridges was, and we heard of him, Alvin Johnson, the first director of the New School. As part of his work as co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, he collaborated uh, with German scholars Emil Lederer and Hans Speyer in the 1920s. He became aware of the growing threat of fascism and the impact it would have on scholars, not just in Germany. When Hitler rose to power in 1933, Johnson did not fail to react quickly, knowing that independent ideas cannot survive under a regime 
that punishes free thought and burns books. Supported by generous funds and helped by Lederer and Speyer, Johnson, in less than a year, established an institution that was nothing short of what it was called, the University in Exile. Created as a graduate school within the new school, it soon had a faculty of 11 Germans and one Italian, all Jewish refugee scholars who had escaped the claws of the Nazis and fascists and were literally provided a safe haven at the newly created school. There were prominent scholars and researchers, including economists Karl Brandt and Emil Lederer, psychologist Max Wertheimer, and uh, sociologist and economist Frieda Wunderlich, uh, by the way, uh, from Freiburg, and sociologist Hans Speyer. For Johnson, the creation of the university in exile was almost a logical consequence of New School's founding ideal to create an environment for orthodox, for unorthodox views where controversy, tolerance, and civility were to be practiced virtues, an environment of intellectual freedom and free thinking. It is all the more remarkable that he was, as he was met with some resistance and criticism from other universities in the country. Altogether, the new school appointed an impressive 183 refugee scholars to faculty positions from 1933 to 1945, providing them with a new intellectual home and for many, saving them from the horrors of the Holocaust. All that is embodied, as I understand, in the unofficial motto of the new school, to the living spirit. A motto I believe couldn't be more beautiful or more fitting for a place like the new school. These four words, uh, which originally could be found on a plaque in Heidelberg, at the Heidelberg University, um, they were torn down by the Nazis, became the school's motto and were subsequently placed on a similar plaque here in the new school after Thomas Mann spoke about it here in a lecture in 1937. Ladies and gentlemen, in establishing the university in exile, Elvin Johnson did not just create a safe heaven for scholarship. Without him and the university in exile, we in Germany would have lost a part of our history and tradition, a tradition of critical thinking and intellectual freedom. You, the new school, helped us to uphold this tradition and later to restore an essential part of our history that otherwise would have been destroyed. And for this, I, and I cannot emphasize this enough, we are extremely grateful to the new school and will always be. But the links between Germany and the new school do not end there. The bridges Elvin Johnson built by creating the university in exile proved to be of enduring quality. Many Germans would follow the footsteps of the refugee scholars after the war. It was the time when the faculty first came to be known as Little Heidelberg on the 12th Street. In tribute to many scholars who came from the University of Heidelberg, most notably, of course, Hannah Arendt. I was actually quite amused to read uh, from the famous economist Robert Heilbronner, who when referring to the German scholars at the New School in the 1950s, said that almost all the professors speak bad English <laughs> and were not about having their students call them Herr Professor. I'm not sure whether Wilhelm is my uh, teacher, um, uh, still asked uh, the students to do so uh, when he came here in the 1970s, although he was a pretty old-fashioned uh, type of uh, professor. But I'm sure he did enjoy what was left of this little Heidelberg atmosphere back then. The list of those who over the years have either sought refuge or later taught at the New School reads like a who's who of social scientists, philosophers, and political scientists. Erich Fromm, 
Aaron Govic, Leo Strauss, Hans Jonas, and of course, as already mentioned, Hannah Arendt and Max Wertheimer, to name just a few of them. But the list is, of course, much longer. By the way, um, I was so pleased to see many of them represented with uh, reprinted contributions in the new spring issue of social research in uh, the 80th year of the publication. Not only do those great minds form part of the living spirits and tradition of intellectual freedom of the new school, but they also represent the close German-American ties that emerged from the Second World War and are now pillar of our transatlantic alliance. Thank you once again for these amazing accomplishments. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the second part uh, of my remarks, uh, um, as I have been asked um, to share a few thoughts uh, on the state of affairs in transatlantic relations and to address some challenges uh, facing uh, Germany in this context. Germany emerged from the Cold War as a winner, politically. It was reunified thanks to strong US support, by the way, a support that we will never forget. I, I think that uh, this was one of the finest hours of uh, American statesmanship and diplomatic craftsmanship to see this freedom movement happening all over Eastern Europe, also in Germany, uh, assessing it, recognizing it, that it was unstoppable, but trying to direct it in, in the right di direction. I think that was uh, an incredible achievement of which uh, Germans are still very grateful. All of a sudden, my country was surrounded only by friends, nine neighbors, all friendly. However, economically, Reunification turned out to be a huge challenge. In 1999, after years of economic hardship, Germany was called the sick man of Europe. Over the ensuing decade, Germany undertook uh, what were sometimes painful structural forms, with which um, quite some success. Thus, in 2013, The Economist revised its view. On its front page, it now declared Germany as Europe's reluctant hegemon. And in 2014, even, Germany reached the top of the BBC's annual country rating poll as the country with, I quote, the most positive influence in the world. Now, that was very flattering. Uh, and that view, of course, is not representative of what um, the whole world thinks of us, but it was a barometer. The truth in uh, 2015, however, is that now, 25 years after reunification, Germany finds itself in a radically different and changed environment. Putin's annexation of Crimea could mark the end of the post-Cold War European order that we knew. The European economic crisis has not yet been fully overcome. The Middle East is in flames. Our liberal international order is under severe pressure, it's under stress. And in the midst of this, Germany has been propelled into a leadership position that it has not expected nor actively sought. So what does this mean for transatlantic relations? Allow me to briefly look at three major challenges uh, my country is facing today. First, Europe and the future of the European Union. The economic and financial crisis over the past five years has exposed a degree of fragility in the European institutional architecture and political fault lines that we had deemed, clearly deemed, overcome. And it's not over yet. Greece is at, the, at a crossroads. Currently, the ball is in Greece's court. The Eurozone is waiting for the Greek government to present their proposals for the reforms needed to put Greece back on a sustainable path and to rebuild trust with its European and international partners. And we've made it clear, very clear, we want to keep Greece in the Eurozone. Greece is an essential part of our common European house. But as I have learned here from this job uh, as ambassador to Washington, right from the start, not only among Europeans, 
but also among Americans and Germans, views about how to manage the European economic and financial crisis have differed quite sharply at times. US experts and officials have criticized Germany for doing too little too late in easing monetary and fiscal policy. And the reason for this may be that Germany has insisted on a more difficult and as we would see it, more sustainable path. We continue to believe that the crisis of excessive sovereign debt and, and the lack of competitiveness in some European countries can only be overcome through sustainable measures, not just flashes in the pan. Thus, and that is gradual fiscal consolidation, structural reforms, and investment, targeted investment, both public and private. Ladies and gentlemen, the discussion about Europe and its economy is inextricably, inextricably linked to its neighborhood. This is the second transatlantic challenge that I would like to discuss, the future of our relationship with Russia. The crisis in Ukraine has meant a true paradigm shift in East-West relations. Old style geopolitics seem to be back. Russia, it seems, has become a revisionist power, bent on undoing the post-Cold War European order. Let us, let me make this absolutely clear. This has go not gone unanswered by Germany and will not go unanswered. In fact, the unity of the Western value-based community, including the US and the 28 EU member states, is impressive. I've no doubt it actually does impress and has surprised also the Kremlin. We made our approach clear from the very beginning of this conflict. Number one, we will not accept any aggression by Russia against its neighboring country, not in Crimea, not in eastern Ukraine. We remain ready to talk in order to achieve a peaceful settlement, but we are also ready to impose rising costs on Russia if and whenever necessary. The biting sanctions by the US and the EU, drafted, by the way, in very close coordination between the governments of Germany and uh, the United States, testify to the determination and unity of our transatlantic partnership. And this is a great asset, that we stay together over the sanctions issue. Second. NATO territory remains unviolable. We are ready to counter any thinkable attack. And this reassurance policy is non-negotiable. And Germany is actively contributing to it, among other ways, with additional personnel in Poland and the Baltics, uh, more surveillance flight of the German Air Force, and an increase in our defense budget. Three, my country not only supports the political efforts to settle the conflict, we are playing a leading role in them. Chancellor Merkel and the Foreign Minister Steinmeier are keeping the channels of communication open with Moscow and engage in a dialogue, a difficult dialogue as it sometimes turns out to be. Chancellor Merkel's shuttle diplomacy this February to facilitate an agreement together with the French President Hollande on the so-called Minsk package was, I dare say, almost an unprecedented uh, diplomatic move to defuse a hot military conflict. We are supporting the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, and its efforts on the ground. We are flexible, though, when it comes to other conceivable formats or approaches, if it serves the purpose. But one condition is a condition sine qua non. There can be no solution over the head of the Ukrainians. That would be a no-go. Which leads me to point four, assistance to the Ukrainian government and its people. Even without the fighting and Russian uh, interference in, in the Ukraine's east, the country would have enough challenges to face in its struggle to modernize. We need r massive financial transfers to help through economic assistance and, and financial assistance through advice. 
This is another area where we are working hand in hand with our European and American friends. However, whatever we do, we need to think it through, assess all the consequences. And that is why my government at this point in time opposes the delivery of lethal military weapons to the Ukrainian army. And this is a hot, hotly contested debate, uh, especially on the Hill in Washington, and I'm spending a lot of time there to talk to um, members of Congress and, and senators. Yes, Ukraine has the moral right to defend itself, and others have the right to support them in doing so. But if this leads to a situation where, as US Deputy Secretary of State Blinken put it rightly, Putin only needs to double, triple, and quadruple whatever we might deliver, nothing will be won for the Ukraine. On the contrary, the risks of a farther outreach by separatists with Russian assistance becomes much more likely, even before the weapons will arrive. The, this crisis will not be over. We are, I believe, in for a longer haul. But we find ourselves in a position where we are able with the United States to face it in a united way and act in lockstep. Ladies and gentlemen, the unexpected uh, Russian assault on the post-Cold War order has led to a reassessment of the Atlantic Alliance. Some even have called it a renaissance. But what I would call the transatlantic challenge, and this is my final point, goes beyond Russia. There is no major international crisis where we, do not, where we do not seek the close cooperation and partnership with America. From Afghanistan to our common goal to defeat the terrorist threat uh, of ISIL, we are working closely together. How did the experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, we know that this war-weary country is engaged in a debate of whether, how, and where America should and must engage in the world. In case you're interested um, in Germany's response to this question, and after all, you invited the German ambassador to speak, my answer is clear. American leadership is still indispensable. Take the fight against ISIL. Believe, I believe that no other countries, no other country in the world would have been able in such a short time to bring together such a large coalition of nations to fight this threat. And the just concluded framework agreement with Iran is another example. Had it not been for the courageous efforts of the US to engage in active diplomacy with Iran, we would not have come to this, I would say, very hopeful point where we are now. We need to be rather more than less ambitious in our transatlantic cohesion. The transatlantic trade and investment partnership, TTIP, is a case in point. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to shape global standards and we should not miss it. Ladies and gentlemen, the transatlantic partnership is a success story which we treasure and foster. It is part of the nature of an alliance between democratic, open societies that any dispute becomes visible and open to often exaggerated specula speculation. I tend to think of it from a totally different perspective, i.e. rather as a sign of strength. There's no hidden agenda, no issue swept under the carpet. Just as free dialogue within our democratic society best serves our countries, so too does it strengthen our friendship. Ladies and gentlemen, I said earlier that the international liberal order is under pressure. It is an order characterized by democratic values, individual liberties, and intellectual freedom, all values embodied by the new school. When Chancellor Merkel, Angela Merkel, was awarded an honorary degree from the New School six years ago on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the founding of the University in Exile, she said, and I quote, the University in Exile is an impressive example of what belief in the power of freedom can achieve, end of quote. I couldn't agree more 
with that statement, and I believe it is today more relevant than ever. So let the new school be a constant reminder of these values, and faced with the challenges I mentioned earlier, let us be guided by this power of freedom that the history of the new school so well embodies. I thank you for your attention. Good evening. Uh, we've done a lot of talking at you, and I hope uh, shortly one of the purposes is we'll hear from you and uh, we'll get up into dialogue with the, uh, the ambassador. Um, I wanted to begin simply by, by saying that uh, uh, if you were 21 in 1969, yes, I am that old, uh, and you were an undergraduate in a Canadian institution, it was possible on a given day, if you were an undergraduate, to believe that your entire curriculum came from this place in New York called the New School of Social Research. Because you were reading, you know, Carl, Man uh, Carl Mannheim on the sociology of knowledge, you were reading Leo Strauss, you were reading, above all, Hannah Arendt, Hans Jonas. If you took a religion course, you were reading Paul Tillich. Um, the list goes on. Uh, I, I think that's where I want to begin. Uh, when I say thank you to this institution, um, I was changed by it as a young undergraduate in, in Canada. And the imprint of these books and these thinkers has been really lifelong. Uh, and I, in preparing tonight, read uh, some wonderful things, particularly written by Ira Katz Nelson about the history of this Place, the unruly alliance between American liberal progressivism after the Palmer Raids in 1917, the unruly alliance between that American liberal progressivism and this liberal anti-totalitarianism uh, that came from uh, Europe between 33 and 45. But that very unruly marriage between two uh, progressive traditions um, uh, has had an effect so far beyond these walls, and it's a moment to just thank that unruly fusion of two traditions and uh, acknowledge how much the world is a better place uh, because of it. Et il faut pas oublier les Français, because I'm Canadian, we do a little French. Um, <laughs> il faut pas oublier Claude Lévi-Strauss, il faut pas oublier Jacques Maritain, il faut pas oublier Roman Jacobson, three great uh, uh, intellectual figures who were brought here to the École des Hautes Études Libres and in typical French fashion kept themselves entirely apart but <laughs> are nevertheless a proud and distinguished part of these uh, traditions. I want to talk just very briefly because I, I hope also I get a chance to engage with the ambassador about some of the things he said but there are kind of three ways in which I think you could think about the university in exile and social ref research, you could think of it as a memory, you can think of it as an inspiration, and you can think of it as a reproach. And I just want to draw out each of those three a little bit. If you think of social research and the new school as a memory, one of the things is that memory and historical memory falsifies. Ex post tonight, ex post tonight, we bask in the memory. We celebrate the memory. Ex ante, as, as Ira Couts Nelson's wonderful work reveals and as the history of the New School uh, reveals, there was a tremendous amount of resistance to the idea of creating uh, a university in exile. And it's, it's important to remember that because it's part of our history too. Um, there were people inside the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation has a very distinguished part in supporting the university in exile, but there were people in the Rockefeller Foundation we now know who said, if you bring all those Germans, there'll be too many Jews. And if, if you look at the, the ways in which B'nai B'rith and the American Jewish Congress reacted to the prospect of mass migration of the German intellectual elite after 1933, there were Jewish organizations who th said, given the anti-Semitism in 
America in the 1930s, more Jews will make it more difficult for the Jews at home. This is a minority current. I'm not saying it was the dominant current, but it's this kind of thing we need to remember. We need to remember it for one very simple reason. Uh, in addition to the people saying there, were, there would be too many Jews, there were people who said there'd be too many radicals. My point being is that good causes, and this is the absolutely good cause of all time, good causes only become good causes later. Ex ante, they're difficult, controversial causes that arouse a great deal of resistance. And it is a testimony to Alvin Johnson, to the people who did this, that they overcame resistance uh, and that this city ended up being so incredibly welcoming. Uh, and so that's the first thing. Uh, we've got to remember that good causes uh, don't become good causes until uh, they're in happy retrospect. The second thing we can think of is that social research and the new school are an inspiration. And they certainly are an inspiration uh, in respect of one thing that I think is focused by this moment, which is that we live in a zone of safety. We live in liberal democracies. Uh, I've grown up on the North American continent beside you folks. Uh, it's a good place to be, safe. Uh, my liberties, my freedoms are never really in question, although we, we've had some narrow misses in the McCarthy era. But we, the, this moment makes us aware that liberal freedom is surrounded by capitalist authoritarianism, by brutality, and above all, by deep and continual repression of free ideas. And uh, if you think now, what kind of inspiration could the university in exile give us in 2015? It would ask us now, are we doing enough about scholar, scholars at risk? Are we doing enough about endangered scholars? One of the wonderful things about that 80th anniversary issue is that it begins this unbelievable uh, collection of riches. And if you don't leave this place tonight and grab yourself a copy, you're crazy. It's just a treasure from beginning to end. Paul Tillich, Leo Strauss, everybody. But at the beginning of that book, the 80th anniversary issue, do not miss the reference to Scholars at Risk. This is where Arian Mack takes the experience, the memory, and turns it in, into inspiration. It only becomes inspiration if we're dedicated to the protection of scholars at risk around the world. And the people I'm thinking about are the, the blogger in Bangladesh who got hacked to death in January for free thought on an Islamic subject. I'm thinking of the blogger in Saudi Arabia who's just had a thousand lashes inflicted in a country which happens to be the long-term strategic ally of the United States. I'm thinking of the 150 students and teachers, fellow intellectuals, fellow academics like us in Garissa, Kenya, who were massacred just last week. This is the world we're in. If we want to take inspiration from uh, the university in exile and from 80 years of social research, the least we can do is stump up for scholars at risk, sustain and develop the Scholars at Risk Network at NYU and in this university, I say to my shame and some embarrassment when I check this, that at Harvard, which as you know is a quite wealthy liberal arts organization to the north of us in a small provincial town called Boston, they have a Scholars at Risk program that is so underfunded it's a disgrace. So if we want to take inspiration from this moment, uh, I think we've got to start thinking about the people who need our protection and defense. So in a sense, <laughs> A memory becomes an inspiration when it becomes a reproach, is I guess my, 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 my theme here. Um, where is the university today in the Anglo-American world that would have the daring of an Alvin Johnson in 1933? Seems to me characteristic and fascinating that this was a kind of 
daring avant-garde institution in the 20s, early 30s, and it was this institution, not Harvard, not Yale, that stood up and created and responded to the cataclysm of uh, fascism in Europe. Uh, this, this memory addresses a reproach, it seems to me, to the state of academic um, life today. Where is the university today whose tenure rules would allow it to make a permanent home for scholars in peril? I sit on an appointments committee at a university I'm very devoted to, but I'm not sure we'd give anybody a long-term appointment. Well, if you don't think about your tenure rules, how can you actually protect scholars who need protection, not for six months, not for a year, but possibly for a lifetime? What's, what journals, what journals will publish scholars as social research did? Ask yourself of the state of academic publishing today. Ask yourself uh, with all these highfalutin referee journals, which are your ticket to tenure in an academic system. And as I say, I sit on these tenure committees and I value the, the traditions of academic learning and scholarship. Yes, I too am a samurai warrior like with the best of them. But I do find myself asking troubled questions about the ways in which we promote and hire people, make it more difficult for us to display the elementary intellectual solidarity that was displayed in this place 80 years ago. That's my kind of polemical uh, point. We have global universities we, with global campuses, but do we have global solidarity for that communion of scholars and intellectuals and free thinkers, particularly in the Islamic world, who are getting hammered, who are getting arrested, who are getting jailed, who are getting intimidated. So this is, I think, the message I take from this anniversary, that it's a happy memory, it's an inspiration, but it's also, uh, in some sense, a reproach. But think, finally, what solidarity, the academic solidarity and intellectual solidarity that was shown in this place, in this institution, what it did for us. When I think about how I understand totalitarianism, it all came out of this place. Those German scholars transformed the way the entire world thinks about tyranny. There are few more important subjects than thinking hard about tyranny. And tyranny assumes new, insidious, inventive forms with every age. Uh, the ambassador referred to the new Putin regime. It's a distinctive new form of capitalist authoritarian tyranny, which is distinct from totalitarianism, distinct from fascism, but is reproducing new forms. We need to have the scholars in peril from those societies in experiencing capitalist authoritarianism to begin to understand this form as Hannah Arendt understood totalitarianism in her era. So I'll conclude here and just say, let's hope that the memory of the university in exile, let's hope that the example of this superb 80th anniversary collection retains its capacity to inspire us retains its capacity to move us, and also attains, retains its capacity to reproach us. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, Ambassador, I, I, I think I've only got time for one question because I can see an impatient audience of people who want to ask you questions and they probably got better ones than I do. But I just, I, I just want to tell you a very brief story. It, I promise it'll be brief and it ends with a question. I have some fantastic German students at the Kennedy School and they are McCloy fellows, John J. McCloy, a great American statesman. Uh, these scholarships are named after him. It's kind of symbol of this German-American relationship. And these are terrific students, but when you ask them, here's my my point, when you ask them about the United States, they tell you something interesting. They say, this country is no longer a model for us. We, we've come to the Kennedy School because it's a good school, and we, we come to the new school because it's a good school. We come for the education, but we don't come for the model. 
Your infrastructure is falling apart. You know, go to LaGuardia. It doesn't look as good as our airports. They're, and they're not being aggressive. I mean, our cars work better. Um, <laughs> we're, we're a good deal freer than you are. That is, our constitution and our Grundgesetz guarantees more freedom. You've got all these crazy Tea Party people. You've got capital punishment. You've got this and that. I'm, I'm caricaturing slightly because they, they also like the United States and respect it, but they don't have a feeling that I think you could have found in a German generation in the, in the 50s, the 60s. Then there's a kind of difficult Red Brigade generation in the 70s, but then in the 80s, you get a, a, a resurgence of a pro-American generation in, uh, in, 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 in German uh, young, young people. This generation, 2015, um, likes the United States but doesn't see it as a role model. Does that worry? Well, it shouldn't worry you. It should worry the United States. <laughs> but but do, what I'm getting at is do you see a kind of pulling apart here that's happening in the new generation? And we don't see it. The strategic partnership, as you say, strong as ever, but the cultural mm. You know, that Elvis Presley connection, you know, that kind of Frank Sinatra connection. Is that kind of stretching a bit? Because I felt these, these kids just, for them, Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, you know, Hollywood films, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, all the things that made America so lovable, not so much anymore. Well, I think you could just go one side of the equation, young German Kids, students, uh, they are very critical persons. And here, they are critical of the US. Once they return, they're very critical, trust me, of Germany and the Europeans. And they will probably tell their parents and their friends how wonderful the time was that they had at your university. And when they traveled around, how friendly the people were, how relaxed the people are, as opposed to German professors, and so on. But I mean, I, your question points to, to a challenge, and, and that is that sort of our transatlantic bond has to be grounded on new foundations. So the Cold War experience is not enough anymore. Berlin, the fight about to uphold freedom in Berlin is not uh, enough anymore. You know, the fall of the wall as an inspiring experience of the victory of liberty, that's that's not enough anymore for this generation. So, so I think my, also my challenge in this work is to um, show young Germans that um, we, we, there are still a lot of commonalities that we have in, in values. And there, is, there are other fascinating, interesting aspects of American life that are worthy uh, to aspire to or to admire or even to emulate. And I would name, you know, the uh, you know, the, the, the kind of creativity, the, uh, the, the islands or areas of innovation and creativity. And I would also enlist uh, the universities in, in, in this country as, as uh, areas of enormous uh, free dialogue, creativity, and, and innovation. And, and uh, th that is something I think that Germans could find, young Germans could find attractive. Also, the way that you can do business here, the startup scene. You know, you can found a, a company, you fail, you start again. This dynamism, uh, this uh, relentless will to, to improve and to, 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 to make your own life, to be free and, and to earn your life. Uh, that is also uh, sort of an energy, a vitality, I think, that we can learn from. Another example is diversity. Uh, I think this country uh, can, can, can teach us something about diversity, you know, the, the, the rising minorities here. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that young German can look up to in, in, in the United States. I, I close with, 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 with a sort of remark that is less upbeat, and, and that is, I think, uh, what divides us uh, transatlantically is sometimes a worldview in between the, the, the two uh, sort of poles here, legitimate security interests 
surveillance of citizens because there are threats on the one hand and the protection of privacy and individual rights. And, and to find the right balance of those two things, um, legitimate security interests on the one hand and the protection of right to privacy, that, that's a transatlantic challenge. And this, there we need to find more common ground. Yeah, and if you tap the chancellor's phone, it's not going to go so well for you. <laughs> not so balanced, am I? Am I right? Uh, okay, um, I've had my uh, I've had my uh, chance here. Um, there are, we've got uh, exactly 20 minutes. There is a microphone there, and there is a microphone there, and um, uh, the only. Not a lot of people know this, but a question is a short interrogative statement followed by a question mark. And I just took Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, we need a new university of exiles. I, I feel as if we're living in the 1930s all over again, mm -hmm. and that since then we've had nuclear weapons and climate change. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why people haven't learned to speak as if we're dealing with the human race as mm -hmm. opposed to nation states that are just have to keep on repeating exactly the same type of rhetoric that preceded the Second World War. I'm just wondering why we're moving back into that type of rhetoric more and more, and why we can't think of something really wonderful for a new University of Exiles to talk about. I defer to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think I said, I think I said that um, this example that we're celebrating is a reproach, and I think you're picking that up. And I, I, I've been in politics, I've been a writer, I don't, I love universities, I deeply care about them, and I think anybody who looks at these hugely wealthy institutions worries that we are not looking at the problems that matter, and we're not often doing, we're not producing the desperately needed knowledge that you need to solve those problems. So um, I, I sh I, that's my point about reproach. That these are moments when we kind of get together and we think, how do we do better here? And I think you've put your finger on some things we're not dealing with. Um, and I think the ambassador was saying, yeah, some of the rhetoric um, that we're seeing in Europe, some of the uh, attempt to reimpose spheres of influence, uh, to shut down the self-determination of peoples, um, is reminiscent of things we've seen before. Um, and our task now is to make sure we don't go off the cliff. And the ambassador has made the German position very clear on how we avoid going over the cliff. Sir. Thank you. Uh, considering where both of you come from, the, the countries you come from, and Germany's, uh, Germany, I guess, invented the welfare state idea, and um, uh, Canada's been more advanced in terms of uh, social legislation than the United States has been, and now the somewhat limited uh, welfare state that we have here has been under attack, under ideological attack for several decades and under very severe political pressure now. Uh, I'm wondering, I hope this isn't too broad, uh, whether you could uh, offer some advice from your vantage points to, uh, to us here on, on this question. Well. I think I've learned um, giving or trying to give advice in domestic political affairs to Americans that will backfire. <laughs> um, but um, I make one remark. Um, observing here uh, the, the ferocious discussion about Obamacare, um, I think many Germans are scratching their head. Um, you know, we, we commemorate the 200th anniversary of the birth of Bismarck, and he introduced in the um, 80s, I believe, of the 19th century uh, legislation, and that came top down uh, on, on insurance. So for us in Europe, um, health insurance is something 
that don't even merit a debate. Uh, this goes without saying that everybody should be insured. So this is something that we have gotten used to when we observe that debate here about the merits of, of health insurance for everybody. I, I'm, I fully understand that there are a lot of different traditions at work here, a, a much more individualist approach uh, to social problems. But, but this is sort of my uh, answer that I'm, I was a little puzzled to see how deeply those aversions against health insurance run in this country. But that's an expression of amazement. That's not an advice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd add to the, what the German ambassador said. Um, the one group of persons Americans are least likely to listen to on any subject is Canada. Um, <laughs> and especially on the subject of health care. Um, and a Canadian can only observe with bemused horror at the ways in which the Canadian experiment, experience is used in the American debate, death panels. We have death panels north of the border, I was astonished to discover. We have no such thing. Um, the, the, again, the one thing I would observe is I think that there's a disconnect between a anti-Obamacare discourse and the facts of enrollment. There's a very, very substantial surge in enrollment. People, I think, are voting with their feet. It's not to say Obamacare is fine. There may have been some com compromises in Congress that um, make it suboptimal. But I think millions of Americans have coverage now and didn't have it before. It's just as simple as that. And those that fact begins to create political facts on the ground going forward. It, it creates a constituency that does not want this taken away. Um, as for welfare states more generally, um, I am a liberal and I am a passionately committed one and I am a passionate defender of social decency and welfare states. And all I can say is that I ran an election in 2011 saying those things and got soundly and thoroughly defeated. So I, I just want to highlight the enormous difficulty that liberals have in defending these decencies now and defending the tax base required to fund them. And I would confess failure in my attempt to articulate a, an account of why this so, matters so much that would convince my fellow citizens. So I. I I'm convinced of the, the importance of the welfare state, but deeply troubled by our difficulty in providing liberal political arguments that work with a skeptical, taxed out uh, citizenry. So. Yes. Um, uh, Professor Ignatiev, as someone who recently attended the annual general meeting of Amnesty International USA, because it was held in Brooklyn this year, and uh, that included a panel just devoted to Raif Badawi, the Saudi blogger. I thank you for your attention to human rights and for your distinguished record in that. But I suppose that my question continues the theme of reproach, because it, it seems to me, sir, that one can interrogate the extent to which the United States remains a zone of safety for human rights. Guantanamo is still open. The war in Iraq was based on lies. Uh, many people believe that the, the president who initiated it and carried it out should be subject to an impeachment, myself among them. So I'm wondering if I could get a sense of um, how you see the, the contradictions that remain in the United States. We can, we can talk also about the Black Lives Matter movement. How you see that as integrated into your overall human rights perspective. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, very briefly, I, I think someone like me who's a Canadian and lived here on and off for many years and who has a absolutely passionate love of this country. I, I think I can say that 
uh, absolutely sentimental love of American liberty, um, is very troubled uh, by the, the instances that you adduce, not just those, but picking up the newspaper this morning and seeing a, a black man shot in the back by a cop. Uh, and have a taser placed by his body. There's a kind of outrageous um, violation of the rule of law, uh, violation of, of the decencies that this country should stand for. So uh, I did say it's a zone of safety uh, relative to other places, but this is a troubled country. It is troubled by its injustice. It's troubled by its violence. It's troubled by the deep stain of slavery and its heritage. It is, a, it is a troubled country. Part of the reason I love this country is that it's a troubled country. But it's a troubled country. And what would worry anybody, because I believe in politics, is a sense that the political system is jammed and can't address some of these things. So I, I would share your, your concerns. But I'm also one of those friends of the United States who is tired of hearing the language of American decline. I just think it's a damn foolish thing to bet against this country, by which I mean it's a damn foolish thing to bet against its capacity to renew its institutions. And so I hope it will in renew those institutions. Professor and Professor, as an international student, I wonder uh, how do you think about China lead Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? Sorry, could, could you repeat that again a little more slowly? I just didn't hear it. Okay. Hi, Professor and Ambassador. As an international student here, I wonder how do you think about China lead Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? Uh huh. Question about the China. Infrastructure Investment Bank. Well, I want to hear the German ambassador on that one, I'll tell you. Great question. Um, it has um, exposed some fault lines uh, in the group of the major industrial countries, and we read that all in the newspapers. Um, I think uh, the administration was not uh, overly enthusiastic about the fact that um, Great Britain, my country, France, Italy, uh, South Korea, Australia, and others uh, tried uh, to look at the possibility to join this bank. It's not a decision yet. Whereas uh, this administration uh, had been um, skeptical uh, about it. Now, uh, the position is that also the US will eventually look at the conditions under which this bank is going um, to operate. So there was a little bit of a fault line here in our uh, Western approach um, to, to the Chinese proposal to establish um, an Asian uh, infrastructure investment bank. Now, I think um, it is a proposal that is explicable. Um, I think the Bretton Woods institutions a creation of the post uh, world the post war world order have failed to adapt to the new circumstances congress um, has failed to ratify the imf reform and i think uh, that <laughs> triggered uh, plans in china to say if uh, the bretton woods institutions don't give us more say uh, as, as, as the second largest economy in the world, then uh, we <coughs> propose alternative models. And I think that is the fact that China puts this uh, proposition on the table, and there is a huge need for infrastructure financing in Asia, is also a result of, of our inability uh, to adapt, modernize, and reform the Bretton Woods institutions. I think the only thing I'd add here is that, that there are two ways to look at this. Either this is the sign of China's 
the beginning of China's displacement of the United States as a global power. It's one of those moments where you feel the big hinge of history turning. And I think we shouldn't overdo that. It seems to me that you can't have it both ways. The United States has spent 10 years saying China is a free rider on the institutions created at the end of the Second World War to run the world. And when will China step up and create institutions to strengthen global order? And now China has done so with this bank. And a lot of Americans are saying, oh my god, right? You can't have it both ways. If they're not going to be free riders, then they're going to create institutions. And the strategic question for the United States is whether it helps to make those institutions work and integrates them into the existing institutions we have. Oh, sir. Yeah, this is uh, for the professor. You touched upon this theme that uh, the possibility of uh, the Tea Party crowd, emerge, or they are emerging as a powerful force in this country, powerful political force, and they're controlling the political destiny of this country cannot be, possibility cannot be ruled out. Mm -hmm. And they are going to, if they become powerful and uh, become influential, there is a possibility of posing a threat to the fundamental principle on which this institution was built. Mm -hmm. The openness, intellectual openness. Mm -hmm. They are moving towards intellectual closeness. Mm -hmm. uh, and your thought on that? Mm. Um, well, very briefly, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, say something you don't expect, which is, yes, I take the, I found some of the intellectual closure of the Tea Party people uh, hard to take. But, you know, I just think we all got to fess up here to our own closure. I've spent a lot of time, I spend most of my time because I'm a liberal with liberals. If you're in Cambridge, Mass. in 02138, you live and breathe and work with people who reproduce your own opinions every day. And it's, it's a, so we're all in bubbles, is what I'm saying. And, and one of the things that is worrying about the United States is that we're not talking to the Tea Party, they're not talking to us, and a healthy democracy is surely a place where once in a while you hear something you really disagree with and don't want to hear. And, and we have, we are self-sorting. All the evidence is, the demographic evidence is that we're, this, the big sort is on. And so we less and less hear a discouraging word. And that's not good for democracy. So my sense is we've got a big job to reach out, listen, hear stuff we don't want to hear. They have got to hear that liberals are not the kind of grotesque caricature of which we are portrayed on the shock radio on the right wing. Um, we got to break down the bell jars. We got to get out of the bell jar. And the reproach that we address to them is a, is a reproach that should properly also be addressed to us. Guten Abend. Um, ich habe Deutsch gelernt für drei Jahre um, in Mali und uh, hier in Amerika. Um, as I was saying, I was, I've been learning German for three years um, here and in Mali, West Africa. And um, what I realized upon coming here is that, and also being in Mali, is that um, it's difficult to connect with the German culture um, in general um, for young people. Um, I've realized that um, the New School has a great relationship with um, Germany, and what I want to um, put out there is that maybe it is not the same for the newer generation um, and that around the world. Isn't there something we could um, do to sort of um, provide more of what Germany is about to the younger generation? Um, for example, I was, I was at school um, in California and I had to completely halt um, my well, learning German because my school did not provide it. And outside of school, it was an astronomous amount of, <laughs> of money to give. So it's, I don't know, I'd like to know what you would think about um, having the German language and the German culture more available to young people around America and around the world. 
Well, first of all, a great many compliments for your German. Uh, Im impeccable pronunciation, no accent after two years. Uh, that's wonderful. And uh, I think you are the living proof of um, somebody who is interested in that culture and can learn the language. Uh, I would uh, make two recommendations. There is a Goethe Institute here in, um, in New York City, in Manhattan, uh, just opened a new building. Um, and there is, and of course, they offer uh, language courses. And then there is um, the, the NYU uh, Deutsches Haus that also offers language courses. They have a cultural program. The Goethe Institute um, is a very active institutions, uh, institution with a very rich cultural program. And maybe um, you feel tempted to travel to Berlin next summer. Uh, that's the coolest place to go right now in Germany. And uh, you will find uh, plenty of inspiration of uh, young culture there. Uh, it's uh, a very cheap city as opposed to uh, New York City. You can, you can live by, I would say, um, $10 a day or so. Uh, so that's something I would recommend. Uh, we've got time for two questions. Keep them short. Uh, this mic and that mic. And then that's it. Uh, um, well, uh, thank you for being here. And uh, it's always great to see um, a member of the German government um, here represented. I really truly believe that, that Germany should give a great example, not just to the United States, but to the entire world, of how a country can persevere if it disengages from warmongering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we should get a great example uh, from that. Now, since I mentioned the, the term war, of course you are aware that recently, I mean a couple of days ago, the Greek government gave a bill to the German government for their World War II uh, financial debt and their reparations. Now, if the Greeks were Jews, I doubt if the German government would have any objections to paying that. Uh, are you going to pay that? Are you going to honor your World War II debt, which is both financial and also reparations to, to, uh, to, uh, to Greece? That's number, uh, number one. Uh, number two, it's easy to pontificate on, let's say, freedom of expression and academic freedom and... But then why does Germany has a law that imprisons people who don't agree with... who have a different view on World War II history? Thank you. On World War? On, 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 on uh, World War II. On World War II? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, on, on Greece, um, I think uh, it's my firm conviction. Uh, well, it's not a conviction, that's a fact. Uh, during World War II, uh, Germany has inflicted uh, incredible suffering on, on Greece when it um, occupied, occupied parts of uh, Greece and um, uh, the atrocities that were committed, I think, should never be forgotten. Um, there were certain instances um, and agreements where Germany paid war reparations uh, at um, the London um, conference in the 50s and later on. The position of, of my government is that the issue that we are now dealing with, um, you know, uh, the program um, extended by international creditors, the IMF, the... I'm talking about Greece. Uh, there are two separate issues. I'm talking about the World War II. I'm not yes. connecting it at all with the, the negotiations about the, the, this no, is something no, but else. My, my you, you, point, you, you, my have point was you have a 200 billion euros bill from World War II that you haven't paid. Fine. Yeah, my, my, my argument was, and this is the position of my government, that this um, demand uh, to pay this sum that you just mentioned uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a reparation to the atrocities that were committed or to the forced loan uh, in the Second World War um, should not be confounded with the current negotiations uh, on, um, on, on the Greek program. Um, and the position of my government is that uh, 
previous governments have paid the war reparations. Um, I would, however, stress, and that's my personal opinion, um, that uh, it would be foolish to belittle uh, the suffering of the weak people and the memory of, of that suffering that's still in existence. And that also says something about the way we should interact with each other um, when we have to deal with difficult issues right, right now. Um, the second aspect of, of, of your question was, is Holocaust denial? Yes, there's a law. It's, it's not only, it's also about the, how World War II happened, who is responsible. I mean, it's, okay. it's yes, okay. there, there are people who have different views and you imprison them for having different right. views. Well, that, then, that doesn't fly well with that, academic that freedom. That would be uh, new to me. I just know that Holocaust denial is um, a criminal offense in our country. Okay. Next speech, question. Criminal offense. Got it. Next question. Good evening. Um, I landed here quite randomly. I'm, I'm from Malta, um, which is the smallest member of the European Union, both in terms of size and population. Um, and I'm interested in intellectual um, uh, intellectuals who were endangered back in the 16th century. But I, I did appreciate your call um, nowadays for um, universities offering um, space for um, intellectuals. And particularly, I'd just like to ask a question, taking the cue from a comment you made, Professor, about um, us having global campuses, but speaking very little about um, global solidarity. Yeah. Um, and I'll ask this also to the ambassador, because perhaps one of the big problems where uh, a mea culpa would be very much in place is that we speak, we've spoken a lot about liberty and about equality, but solidarity has not featured that much, especially in European political discourse, if not among m member states. We speak, we've spoken very little about solidarity among and between peoples um, as opposed to solidarity between states. So do you think that um, what we are facing, this reluctance perhaps to uh, um, agree to your call so quickly has also, is also the result of the lack of attention that has been given for the last decades, um, both in Europe and on the side of the Atlantic, to the real understanding of solidarity. Um, thank you for the question and welcome from Malta. Um, it's, a good, it's a good place and uh, with a very heroic record during the Second World War. Um, the, uh, the issue of solidarity is, um, is troubling everybody. There was a question at the beginning of the hour about the ways in which we are being enclosed in our nation states, the, the limits of our concern for others is being, is retreating back to kith and kin and our own and even within our own nation states, our solidarity towards strangers and towards others is, is um, uh, problematic. If you're a liberal politician and you want to defend a welfare state, you've got to make a case about solidarity and it's not going so well, that was my point earlier. Um, international solidarity is not going so well either. Um, uh, but it, it seems to me that we're, <laughs> it's, a, it's a banality to say this, but we're stuck with each other. <laughs> we're stuck with each other. We're stuck with each other's problems. Malta's a good example. Malta's flooded with uh, uh, migrants and people fleeing the troubles in Libya. Uh, troubles that in some sense were caused by military action that didn't go so well and a failure to stabilize that part of the world. Um, uh, we've, Western policies created some problems that have landed flat on your doorstep in Malta. I mean, that's an example of, and you feel quite rightly, where is the solidarity with us? You've stuck us with a problem that we can't solve. I mean, I just put words in your mouth. That was fun. <laughs> I, I've never been, I've never been to Malta in my life. I just made that up, but it, it seems plausible. <laughs> And, and I guess my point about solidarity is that it's about empathy. It's about me kind of taking my helmet off and momentarily putting on a Maltese cross or a Maltese helmet and trying to figure out how it looks. 
because it doesn't look good in Malta. You're, you, you're facing the full brunt of the European immigration, migration crisis. People are dying in the Mediterranean, 3,000 a year, and, and a more fundamental breakdown of solidarity I haven't seen. I teach human rights, and watching people drown in the Mediterranean is a really ugly sight. And they're, it's the same kind of story, fewer people dying, but people do die on the southern border of the United States. Um, one of the places where solidarity has close to collapsed is international migration and international refugees. Uh, we, have the, we are in the middle of the largest uh, refugee crisis in the history of the post-war era in Syria. And all appeals, private voluntary appeals and state government appeals to make sure that the Syrian people are under tents and are protected are underfunded. So these are the specific challenges of solidarity that we need to fix. Solidarity in general, nice word, but we got to disaggregate and fix the places where our solidarity has broken down. I'm sorry to go on so long. You've got the last word, Ambassador. You've said it all to this no. question. I cannot top you. <laughs> we thank you.